Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar this evening. I appreciate you joining in. Uh, we have a panel of individuals here who uh, have given up their time and uh, knowledge to, to share with you this evening some information they have about uh, vaccinations and vaccines, uh, as well as some individuals who just have some personal perspectives they'd like to share. So uh, I want to thank them for their time and uh, introduce them in just a second. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce to you uh, Dr. Rock Jones. He's the president of Ohio Wesleyan University with his own introduction. Uh, thank you, Duane, and good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome you to this information session, and I'm delighted that we can provide you with a stellar panel of medical, public health, and university experts to give you guidance on the upcoming fall semester and to answer questions that have been submitted in advance. I'd like to begin by thanking all of you who have written and called to share your thoughts on the issue of the vaccine. I'm grateful both for your message of support, for which there have been many, for our protocol, and for the questions that some of you have asked about the vaccine requirement. And I want to thank all of you who have shared with Ohio Wesley in the roller coaster of the past year and a half. Throughout the length of this pandemic, we have sought the counsel of experts in areas from public health and infectious disease to remote learning and HVAC ventilation systems. Our goal is always to employ the best knowledge available to fulfill our core mission as a residential liberal arts university. We're a community of scholars teaching and learning together in classrooms, laboratories, playing fields, performance stages, dining halls and residence halls. In all those settings, we are most effective when we can engage with one another directly, in person, and without inhibition. Last year, we beat the odds, and we were able to keep our campus open with a combination of in-person and online learning for the entire year. In the face of a global pandemic, it was a successful year. However, it was also a year that no student and no faculty member wants to repeat. We don't want to repeat the weekly COVID tests, the masks, the distancing and plexiglass screens, the tents, the canceled sports seasons, the weeks of isolation for many students, the sickness, the uncertainty, and the fear. Now that we have the means, we want to move on and once again experience the vibrant Ohio Wesleyan campus that we all love. I look forward to welcoming students back, shaking their hands, helping them move into our remodeled Smith Hall and new Bradford Milligan apartments. I look forward to an unmasked Day on the J celebration. I look forward to a beautiful homecoming weekend with our student athletes and marching bishops on the field. The only way we can do all of this is through universal student vaccination. The Delta variant is now causing a rise in cases in unvaccinated communities. And another fall wave of COVID is being forecast. But we can stop it here. We can protect the most vulnerable in our campus community. We can have the OU experience that we all dream about. It is vital that we follow the best recommendations of public health officials, infectious disease ex experts, and other scientists to keep the Ohio Wesleyan community safe. A new study from Yale University found that the COVID vaccines have already saved 279,000 lives in the United States alone. To protect our community and to ensure a great student experience, it is vital that we require vaccination. Now this evening, I'm delighted to uh, introduce again, Dr. Dwayne Todd, our Vice President for Student Engagement and Success, and the person who has led our COVID response throughout the pandemic. Dwayne will introduce our panelists and will moderate the discussion. Dwayne. Thank you, Rock. Uh, and so it is my pleasure to uh, help you know who is on our panel this evening. Uh, first, I want to welcome Dr. Joseph Gastaldo. Uh, Dr. Gastaldo is a, is a MD with Ohio Health and he is also a specialist in infectious diseases, uh, recognized throughout Central Ohio as perhaps one of the top, if not the top uh, infectious disease expert uh, among us. Mr. Adam Howard is the Director of Preventative Health with Delaware Public Health District, which is our, uh, our uh, public health uh, county entity uh, that we work very closely with in monitoring uh, the virus in, in the region and on campus 
and of course helped us uh, provide a vaccination clinic on campus. Dr. Kira Bailey is our Associate Professor of Neuroscience and Psychology at Ohio Wesleyan. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. John and Debbie Falco are the co-chairs of the Ohio Wesleyan Parent Leadership Council. They're joining us uh, this evening. And we'll also hear from Dr. Jay Martin, who is the Professor of Health and Human Kinetics and our men's head soccer coach. So with that, uh, we have uh, invited people to post some questions ahead of tonight uh, to, to, through a, a form that we sent out uh, so we can be prepared to answer your questions as thoroughly as we possibly can. And we're gonna jump right in uh, to addressing those questions. Uh, the first question is for Dr. Castaldo. Uh, can you help us understand the difference between emergency use authorization, which is EUA for short, and full FDA approval of the vaccines. Um, are, are these vaccines considered experimental under EUA? Yeah, thanks for the kind words and thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I've been really uh, doing nothing but COVID 95% of my job for the last year and a half. And I'm very honored to be here to partner up with, with this group and provide some good information. So uh, emergency use authorization is something that a, a lot of people have never heard of before COVID-19. It was authorized several years ago in the setting of bioterrorism by the government, basically saying if there's an emergency, we have to be able to do things in a much more efficient way. And um, to answer your question right away, these vaccines are not experimental. The clinical trials uh, were done. Uh, that was the experiment in getting the FDA emergency use authorization. When you look at the differences between formal FDA approval for vaccines and emergency use authorization, they're really not that different. One of the differences is that with emergency use authorization, the vaccines, significant doses, millions of doses were made ahead of time before the clinical trials were even done. But the scientific integrity of the vaccine studies, specifically, half the people getting the vaccine, half the people getting the placebo. Uh, these vaccine trials had more people in them compared to other vaccine trials that were FDA approved. So the scientific integrity of these vaccine clinical trials are the exact same way. In addition, the way that we review vaccines through it, three independent review boards, two of which are completely transparent within the FDA and the CDC, is the world's gold standard. No other country reviews the same, uh, has the same process in place to review uh, the clinical efficacy and most importantly, the safety of these vaccines. Uh, at the level of the FDA, the FDA's vaccine subgroup are the country's world's experts uh, in vaccines. Uh, and it's when you look at the cast of characters at the table, uh, they are the who's who in vaccinology, infectious diseases, ethics, statistics. Uh, they are the group who makes the recommendation for FDA authorization. After that, it goes to a second group within the CDC, the Advisory Committee of Immunization Practices. And that group also too consists of 15 voting members along with professional, uh, professional uh, physician group representation from a who's who of uh, medical societies, including the American Medical Society, American College of Physicians, ACOG, and the Infectious Disease Society of America. So these two independent groups are the ones that have to sign off and they review all of the details of the vaccine. These groups are transparent. They're open to the public for anybody to listen. I've listened in on both of those groups and it's not a love fest. Uh, after the vaccine is recommended by the CDC and they leave details for the, for the vaccine recommendations, there is a very robust mechanism in place beyond VAERS and VSAFE for any potential safety signals that come out. To date, we're now in July, we have given over 330 million doses of these vaccines. And due to the mechanisms in place, uh, that process is working because we now have the identification of three serious, but very rare uh, um, incidences with the vaccines. And when you look at these rare occurrences of the vaccines, clearly, the benefit of getting the vaccine far outweighs any rare risk associated with the vaccine. So I know that was a long-winded answer, 
But in short, there's not much different between FDA EAU approval or FDA approval. The scientific integrity is the same, the way the vaccines are reviewed they were the same. And uh, at this point in time, from a physician perspective, clinically, the FDA approval is irrelevant at this time, given the fact that we have given 330 million doses. There is enough clinical information today for all the vaccines to officially be FDA approved. Why they're not FDA approved now is because they have to gather all of the data. It's really a lot of data gathering. And they also have to do a very detailed review of the manufacturing process. Thank you for that explanation. Um, if I could ask a follow-up here, what, um, why is vaccination important? If someone has already contracted COVID uh, in the past, um, at, you know, wh why, is, why is it that we're asking them to be vaccinated on top of having perhaps natural immunity from their own infection? And can you also speak to the recent Cleveland Clinic study um, on the efficacy of natural immunity? Yeah, that, that's a great question. That comes up a lot too. And, and again, it is true. If somebody has had COVID, they do have a degree of immunity. Uh, but um, a couple of things, uh, first thing I wanna say about the Cleveland Clinic study is, uh, the Cleveland Clinic study did not say in the study not to get vaccinated if you have previously had COVID-19. Now, the vaccine recommendations come out of the vaccine advisory group within the CDC. It's called the Advisory Committee of Immunization Practices. When they meet, their meeting is open to the public, it's transparent, they allow people to ask questions, um, and um, it's a very uh, detailed discussion. And like I said, at that table, you have representation of, of 15 experts in the country, along with representation of every major medical society. They are the ones that lead the vaccine recommendations. And at, the, at this time, the ACIP does not count somebody who has previously had COVID as somebody who should not get vaccinated. So a couple points about that. If somebody does get COVID, yes, they do have a level of immunity. However, that is quite variable from person to person. Someone's immunity, what they get in response is really dependent upon two things, a couple things. Number one, their age. Number two, the severity of illness. For example, older people don't get the same robust immune response compared to younger people. People with lower severity of illness don't get the same immune response as somebody with a higher severity of illness. And plus two, there are people with certain specific medical conditions like transplant patients, people on uh, medications that uh, suppress their immune system where they don't get the same immune response uh, from uh, infection. Second thing is, when it comes to testing for immunity, there is no standard test to test for somebody to see if they have immunity. There is an antibody test available, but uh, recently the CDC left a statement out that says antibody testing at this time should not be used as a measure of immunity. Like the vaccines, the antibody tests are also FDA approved under emergency use authorization. It is not yet defined what the number is of an antibody test to measure someone's immunity. The antibody tests that are all available all perform differently. Um, some of them give you a number, some of them don't, some of them measure different antibodies. So it's really uh, which antibody test and how can you definitively prove somebody has had immunity with a blood test. Next thing is really has to do with variants. At this point in time, the predominant circulating strain in our country, about 80% pointed today, pointed out today, is the Delta variant. Uh, the vaccines that we have perform extraordinarily well against the Delta variant. However, that may not be the case for future variants. Uh, for example, in Brazil, the gamma variant, previously known as P1, was their second wave of COVID-19. That variant really didn't take off here. However, in Brazil, they did notice a significant amount of people who were previously infected with COVID who got infected again uh, with the gamma variant, also known as P1. And I can tell you as an infectious disease doctor, we are seeing people who uh, do get COVID a second time. So the variants are, are the, uh, another concern. And then finally, 
it is safe to give people a vaccine who have previously had COVID. There are no safety signals whatsoever in giving somebody who has had a COVID a vaccine. In fact, people who have had COVID who get a vaccine even get a more robust, probably longer lasting immunity from having a vaccination after getting COVID-19. Thank you. So uh, with that, um, Adam, this is uh, maybe a, a question that I would, I would pose to you and it's a follow-up to what Dr. Castaldo said. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, what you are seeing in, in terms of the county related to um, hospitalizations, um, uh, you know, those who are, are coming down with serious illness um, here in, in our region, um, vaccinated versus unvaccinated, what are we still seeing in terms of the, the case, case counts? Yeah, certainly. So um, we, uh, obviously COVID isn't over for us, right? So we're still tracking every case that comes in. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time doing um, is figuring out whether that person was vaccinated prior to uh, getting the illness, uh, because we want to know, are the vaccines holding up? Um, and the numbers that we find here in um, Delaware County, so these are the local numbers um, for our area, are really striking, all right? So if we look at all of the cases um, that either had symptom onset or were tested from March 1st until today, we're looking at 99% of those cases are unvaccinated, okay? So only 1% of those um, represent vaccine breakthrough cases, okay? If we look at hospitalizations um, and deaths, those are the things we really we are really concerned about because we don't want anyone to go to the hospital. We don't want anyone to die. In hospitalizations, 93% of our hospitalizations from March 1st are from unvaccinated folks, okay? And if we look at our deaths and we still are having deaths, okay? From March 1st until today, 100% of our deaths have been in unvaccinated individuals, okay? So it is still a concern. And the director of the CDC recently said that COVID-19 is becoming a, a, a pandemic of the unvaccinated. And unfortunately, our local numbers show the same thing. Um, the disease is still infecting people. It is still putting folks in the hospital. It is still killing people. Um, and it's something we don't wanna see. And the, uh, the fact that the majority of these folks are unvaccinated is just one more reason um, for folks to go out there and get this, this vaccine that's safe and obviously is very effective at this point. Thank you. So a follow-up follow question to that with you. Um, uh, the mortality rate for younger adults, 18 to 29 year olds, let's say, um, is significantly lower than older populations with this, uh, who could track this virus. Um, Delaware County is, you know, in, in pretty good shape uh, compared to some other regions of the, the country um, in terms of our case counts. Um, we had a pretty good spring in terms of uh, the number of cases on campus, although I wouldn't say that about the fall. The fall was pretty rough uh, for those of us trying to manage the case counts on campus. We were successful, but it, it, it took a toll. Uh, and I do not, I would not want to repeat that, but the, the spring was much better. So, um, can you talk a little bit about why, why might the vaccine be needed for this population if mortality rates are so low for them? They, is there a real danger to this population if, if they even do get it? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, this disease is a concern for everyone, right? Uh, and the more folks that get it, one of the, the concerns we have is um, as long as this is still circulating out there, we're going to see variants um, happen. Um, that's just something that happens naturally. We expect to see that. Um, it becomes concerning when it changes um, how, the, how the disease spreads or if it changes the outcomes. And you know, that's some of the things we see with some of these variants is um, they start to change uh, uh, how infectious they are, right? So the more folks infected, um, simply put, the more folks infected, the more chance of hospitalization, the more chance of death. Um, and you know, it's more than just that. So, you know, this is a concern because it is easily spread. You know, we classify this R not number as how many folks it might spread to, you know, and that number um, originally was around 2.5. You could make a case it might be higher now with some of these variants, but that's more than something like the flu. Um, you know, that's probably around double what you're seeing with the flu. Now it's not as high as something like measles, that's 12, 18, um, but it's still a concern. The other thing about this disease and why it's um, concerning right now is it spreads when you don't have symptoms. So it can spread asymptomatically, it can spread pre-symptomatically. 
So even if you're trying to do the right thing and you're trying to protect folks by staying home once you have the disease, you might not know you have it. So you are exposed to the disease, you have it, you go to see grandma who can't be vaccinated for some reason and you've exposed her without even knowing. Um, so being able to spread it without any symptoms is a real concern there. And the reality is this disease kills, okay? Um, when we look at the numbers compared to flu, this is something that folks um, say um, from time to time that it's just a flu. Well, that's, that's not really the case. In 2019 to 2020, there were 38 million cases of flu, okay? Comparable to what we've had of COVID-19, 33, um, 34 million cases of COVID-19. The flu killed 22,000 people that year. COVID-19 has killed over 600,000 people, okay? That's more than World War I and World War II uh, combined for American deaths, okay? You can add a whole bunch of other wars in there too. 1812, Korean War, American Revolution, Mexican War. The reality is this disease isn't just the flu. Um, it kills at a much higher rate overall. Um, and, you know, it's still relatively new. There are, so there are still things we might learn about it later um, that are concerned, whether you're, you know, young or old, the uh, effects later on um, are still being uh, learned right now. I would, I would be remiss, you know, Adam, you were kind of getting there, but one thing I really want to comment on is long COVID. Long COVID is real. You know, just to talk about death alone, that does not the collect the totality of all of the patient experience of what they go through. You know, you're out for a significant period of time. You have to isolate or quarantine. You may be hospitalized. Uh, typically, COVID patients in the hospital are there for a while. But long COVID is, is a real thing. Long COVID, if you look at various studies, is up to 20 to 30 percent of people have lingering symptoms that can go on for months. And some of those lingering symptoms are vaguely described, mental fogginess, a chronic cough, a fatigue, um, and that is yet another reason uh, to get vaccinated so you don't get COVID, which would result in long COVID. But long COVID is happening in younger people. Uh, it really has no correlation with severity of illness. Thank you uh, for that. Um, can, can you, Dr. Gustavo, also address you know, some of the concerning side effects that people have raised myocarditis being one of them, um, versus the effects that you might have from having COVID, you know, the, the risks of those kind of side effects that would be concerning to people <clears throat> versus, you know, these, these sort of health effects that come from having COVID. Yeah, so let's kind of, uh, if it's okay, we'll go through real briefly the three safety signals that came out with the vaccine. The first one that came out uh, was the very rare but serious type of brain blood clot. Um, uh, vaccine associated thrombotic thrombocytopenia is the medical word. It's very, very, very rare. Uh, there is a guided statement out on there. We know what to look for when people have it. But again, the benefits of getting that vaccine far outweigh the very rare risk. COVID causes blood clots to a much higher extent. Uh, the second thing is the myocarditis pericarditis. Uh, uh, um, that is new guidance statement that most recently came out. And roughly the myocarditis pericarditis occurs in one out of 20,000 vaccine recipients. One out of 20,000. It's described more so in younger men, more so with the second dose. It's mild in most cases. It's short-lived and self-resolving. Myocarditis by itself, JAMA cardiology, Big 10 athletes, they did a very sensitive MRI test showing that roughly one out of 40 people who had COVID had myocarditis. So there's a much higher incidence of myocarditis pericarditis uh, with uh, COVID than associated with the vaccine. And then finally, the third safety signal that came up was the very, very rare Guillain-Barre syndrome associated with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Guess what? Influenza, HIV, COVID-19 caused Guillain-Barre at a much higher incidence compared to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So really, uh, you know, what's really important and what I feel comfortable is that there is such a detailed mechanism in place to look for these safety signals. When these safety signals are collected, the CDC's Vaccine Advisory Committee gets together, 
They have all the powers, the smart people at the table, the medical societies. This meeting is open to the public. People can ask questions and they give a guidance statement. And again, everything in medicine, Tylenol, antibiotics, everything has guidance statements associated with them. Great, and then, and then to that point, in terms of data collection uh, on side effects, um, can you speak to you, you and Mr. Howard um, about the VAERS system? What is that? How does information get in there? Um, there's yeah. reportedly I'll, over 9,000 deaths reported. Can you talk to that? I'll, I'll start and then Adam, I'll hand it off to you. VAERS is not new. VAERS stands for the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. Guess what? Anybody can report anything on VAERS a doctor, a nurse, a patient. Yes, it is true, VAERS has had much more reporting since December, but guess what? We have these vaccines out there. We have given 330 million doses. Everybody knows VAERS. Now, you can go to VAERS and look to see what's being reported on there. Just because something is reported on there does not mean the vaccine caused what is reported. You know, at one time in our country, we were vaccinating about two and a half million people a day. Two and a half million people a day, that's a lot. Well, in the baseline of life, there's always a baseline activity of people dying, especially as you get older. There's a baseline activity of 80 year olds dying. There's a baseline activity of people getting breast cancer. There's a baseline activity of people getting in car accidents. So with VAERS, you have to be careful when you look at VAERS. Association is not always causation. Just because the rooster goes cock-a-doodle-doo in the morning, that's not the reason the sun comes up. So again, VAERS is a, is a, a transparent way. Um, it's not perfect, but VAERS, V-SAFE, are the two that most people are familiar with. However, there is much more to those two mechanisms uh, to look for any potential safety signals uh, with the vaccine administration. Adam? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, you know, I, I'm going to echo a lot of the same things here. It's VAERS is a very good tool for early warning because you're able to get a whole bunch of information that you might not otherwise get. You know, they use these kind of systems to find those very rare things, but it's also a passive surveillance system. So looking at that raw data can be misleading. And when you're talking about adverse reactions, that could be as something as simple as me saying, well, I got a vaccine. It was a needle in my arm and my arm was sore the next day. You know, so that is an adverse event that someone could report into VAERS, right? So I, what I typically say here is, you know, if we followed 330 million people who drank a glass of water, inevitably, some of those people would die. You know, is it because they drank that glass of water? No, absolutely not. You know, they were going to have a heart attack. They were going to have a stroke. There was going to be something else there that caused that death. It wasn't the fact that they drank water but they drank water a day before they had the heart attack. So that could be then reported there. So what we rely on is not that raw data. We rely on those experts, those uh, physicians of scientists there to really dive into that and to see, is there any causation there? Um, I can't say it really any better. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and pass off now. <laughs> Thanks. <clears throat> one, one more question, Dr. Castaldo, before we uh, move to some other uh, comments here from folks. Can you speak to uh, the contraindications for the vaccine? Those who, what, what do we know in terms of those who should not receive a vaccine? Um, there are concerns about autoimmune issues. There are concerns about um, um, congenital heart issues. What do we know in terms of who should and shouldn't get it? Yeah, so uh, you know, the, the CDC gives guidance on that. And, and to be honest, we'll, we'll keep it simple. The only true contraindication, meaning that you don't receive the vaccine, is as follows. Number one, a known severe allergic reaction to any of the known components in the vaccines. These vaccines are actually pretty simple. There's no preservatives in these vaccines, and anybody could really uh, go online and look up the ingredients in the vaccines. Most people really don't know if they have an allergy to anything in the vaccine, but uh, nonetheless, if somebody has a history of a severe allergic reaction to other vaccines, they can proceed with precaution in getting these vaccines. When you go to get vaccinated, it's not like going through a drive through window. You have to answer questions. Everybody's observed for at least 15 minutes and for some people, 30 minutes. So um, uh, the only true contraindication to not receive the vaccine is 
if you have a known severe allergic reaction to one of the components in the vaccine. The mRNA vaccines are two shot vaccines. So if you have a severe allergic reaction to the first mRNA vaccine, you should not receive the second mRNA vaccine. However, you could proceed with precaution to receive the single dose of one and done JJ vaccine. However, um, if somebody has a weakened immune system, they can get vaccinated. If somebody has an autoimmune disease, they can get vaccinated. If a, a woman is pregnant, she can choose to be vaccinated. Uh, a common um, um, a fallacy about the vaccine, especially in young women, is that the vaccine is associated with infertility. Uh, I don't want to get into details of that too much, but, but I could say there is no scientific validity to that whatsoever. Uh, that really began out of um, a scientist somewhere in Europe that made that statement, uh, but there is no scientific validity to the vaccine having anything to do with infertility or, or um, for fertility in men. Um, uh, let's leave it at that. Thank you for that. What I'd like to do is just take a little shift here. Um, we have a, a video from Dr. Jay Martin, as I mentioned earlier, is a professor with uh, our health and human kinetics program and the uh, head soccer coach for our men's soccer team. Uh, he recorded uh, just a video he would like um, to share with you all today. Um, and I thought I had it up. Um, let me, while I work on this, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, instead turn it over to Dr. Bailey and let her talk a little bit about her own, um, uh, things that she wants to share with you from her, her perspective as a professor. Thank you, Joanne. Um, yeah, so I, first off, I wanna start by saying that I have taught summer online courses the last five years and I taught remotely this last year. I have also in my lifetime forged a lot of strong friendships with people that I met in online video games. So I am not going to be one of those people that would tell you that you can't make authentic connections online. I think you can. I also think that my colleagues did a fantastic job with remote learning this last year. We worked so hard. I, I mean, probably the hardest I've ever worked in my whole career um, to provide the best possible remote learning experience. And I think that what you saw from us last year is truly some of the best online teaching that you'll see anywhere really. Um, but there are some things that we simply cannot replicate for our students in an online environment. The hands-on learning in a laboratory or an art studio, the active real-time back and forth discussions, the spontaneity of a random question that one student asks, and then the entire class is on this exciting, challenging, meaningful side quest that I didn't even plan. All of those things you miss out from online. Um, and of course, we can't forget things like travel learning courses and the travel that's involved in a lot of the theory to practice grants that the students write. All of these things are an irreplaceable part of an OWU education, and they require that we connect in person. I also want to talk a little bit about support, academic, social, emotional support. It's hard for me to provide it as a faculty member when I can't tell that the students need it or what they need. Knowing in the moment that a student is struggling with a concept because I can look at their face and see that look of confusion um, or fear <laughs> because we're, we're talking about something new, being able to see that is priceless for me as a teacher. It means I can provide that student with immediate support and feedback. As a psychologist and a neuroscientist, I can tell you that social isolation does hurt us. We are a social species. And when we have to be masked and socially distanced and when, or, you know, when everyone's a black box on a screen, all of that contributes to feelings of social isolation. And over the last year, our mental health has suffered from all of the ways that we've lacked the ability to make connections the way that we typically would. Students, I wanna say that you all hung in there really well. And I am so proud of the ways that you rose to all of the challenges that we were facing. 
but when I say that it seemed like everyone, everyone had senioritis by the end of spring semester, I think you know what I mean. It was hard to be with people, but not really be with people. So I want you back in the classroom. I want to see your faces and hear your voices and not be talking to black boxes on a screen or reading chat messages. I want to experience the joy of learning with you in person without these barriers between us. When all of this started back in March 2020, I remember I was chatting with some seniors and the kind of collective feeling at the time was this sucks. But we also talked about how it was going to be okay because we knew science was going to get us a vaccine. We trusted it. And we knew that once we had a vaccine, we could get back to doing the things that we love doing. So we have a vaccine and I am so ready to get back to the things that I love doing. And I want you there with me. I want you in the classroom with us. I want you traveling with us. And the safest way to make that happen is for us to be vaccinated. Great, thank you, Dr. Bailey. All right. Uh, I have. Dr. Martin's video ready to go. I'd like to share that with you. Thank you very much for asking me to do this. I hope that your summer's going well and moving quickly. And pretty sure that soon the doors to Ohio Wesleyan are going to open. And we hope that you will be with us. The last 18 months of the pandemic has been a huge problem for all of us. Academically, we've struggled, and the athletics department has struggled as well. There's not a coach or a team in this department that has done what he or she would like to have done in the last 18 months. And in that time, 4.1 million people have worldwide have died from COVID. We are all looking forward to going backward, back to the pre-pandemic times, back to our routines, back to the classroom, back to the athletic fields. I know firsthand what COVID's all about. My wife, Joanne, contracted the virus a few months ago. And let me just say, it is no joke and it's not very pretty. Today, the Delta, the Delta variant is running rampant worldwide. Look at the Olympics, look at Major League Baseball, look at the European soccer teams. If this continues, we will all go back to lockdown. So what's the solution? The solution is very simple, and that is get a vaccination. I'm 72 years old and I've been vaccinated, and I've had no side effects at all. And I feel very confident now that the vaccination is going to help me move forward. Why don't you let the vaccination help you move forward? And we will continue in this struggle if you don't get vaccinated. And that is not my opinion, that's a fact get vaccinated. All right, and I'd like to hear uh, now, uh, ask uh, John and Debbie Falco to join us uh, as a, some parents who are highly involved at the university. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Uh, I think you've, you've had, uh, a, you know, a, a few students come to Ohio Wesleyan, so you've been around the block for a little while. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you want to share. Thank you. Um, we had two students at Ohio Wesleyan last year. We've had three students uh, at Ohio Wesleyan. Um, but last year was rough. We had a senior and we had a freshman. Um, my senior luckily had, you know, her previous three years had made friendships and had no, and knew people, but still the isolation was significant. Um, but for our freshmen, um, wearing a mask, staying six feet away, not having dinner or lunch with friends, um, only knowing his roommate um, when he got there, that, that's it. There were no other kids from his high school. Um, so the isolation and the loneliness was very concerning. Um, when we would talk to them, um, there would be a Friday and Saturday night that they did laundry and that they were playing video games, they weren't with friends. And that is not a normal college experience. And I was very concerned as a parent um, that depression was going to set in, um, that the loneliness was going to be too much. And I questioned myself about even sending them to be in person. Um, it was it was very scary. And then on top of that, 
my fear as a parent um, was what happens if my child does get sick at Ohio Wesleyan? I don't live in Columbus. How am I going to take care of them if they're not hospitalized? Um, Ohio Wesleyan just simply, they, they did a fantastic job, but they do not have the support or the staff to make sure that our children are taken care of when they are that sick. If they're not hospitalized, um, I can't bring them home. I can't put them on an airplane. I can't sit in a car with them for two hours because then I'm at risk. Um, so was I going to have to take off work and come down there and stay? The, the best answer for us, as soon as Ohio Wesleyan made a vaccination available, my kids were there the first day. Um, and I, oh, so many of our fears um, were, were gone then. They, they were safer. Um, and this year, I'm really hoping that my son can go back as a sophomore and have in-person trumpet lessons um, and, and get back into the classroom and share stories and make friends and eat dinner with somebody. And that's what we're looking for. Um, we just want the mental health of our students to be, to be where it needs to be. And, and frankly, being there without masks and being able to sit next to, to their friends at dinner is, is what's going to do it. Great, thank you very much for that. I appreciate your input. Um, I, I'd like to turn for a bit to some campus policies because a number of questions came uh, through the, uh, the, the earlier form asking about, about our mandate and why we feel we need it. And, and you know, some of maybe what you've heard already might help you understand the information that we have that led to our, our belief that, that a mandate was uh, the right decision for I Wesleyan. Um, but, uh, Rock, can you address why we are requiring it of students, but not of faculty and staff? Uh, sure, Dwayne, and that's a good question. And I'll, I'll say two things about why, and then add a little bit of context as well. We have a number of vaccines that are required of students. Um, these have been in place for many, many years. We do not require those vaccines of faculty and staff, although the vast majority of uh, faculty and staff have those vaccines. So we're being consistent with other policies, a second, students live in congregate settings in the residence halls or in apartments off campus where often large numbers of students gather. Um, and that's where the spread happens. Last year, we did had a significant spread in residential communities. Uh, we had no spread on the academic campus itself. So um, the recognition of the congregate living community in which our students find themselves uh, suggests that we need to require the students to be vaccinated. I will tell you that last week we conducted a survey of faculty and staff the vast uh, uh, to inquire how many have been, been vaccinated. Uh, the vast majority of people have responded and fewer than 20 faculty and staff at the last report I saw um, responded that they were not yet vaccinated or had not yet had um, at least one shot. So uh, the vast majority of faculty and staff are vaccinated. We do plan to require faculty and staff to report their vaccination status so that we can ensure that any unvaccinated faculty and staff are following the protocols of uh, masking, social distancing, and other things that will be required of those who do not have the vaccine. Great, thank you. And next question, why are student athletes allowed to play against unvaccinated students from other teams if this virus is so dangerous? So the NCAA will have protocols in place uh, in the coming year, as it did uh, in the past year, including mandatory testing um, and other protocols for unvaccinated uh, student athletes. Institutions that decide not to require student athletes to be vaccinated will need to be bear the costs of those protocols. There's the cost of testing. There's the additional cost of transportation because students have to be seated uh, farther apart on buses, um, other costs that are associated. I can tell you that in the North Coast Athletic Conference, more than half of the, the schools are requiring students to be vaccinated. So we're in the majority uh, in our athletic conference. Thank you. Um, another question back about uh, sort of the science around this. Um, can you, uh, Adam or, or Dr. Casado, talk about herd immunity? What what, what do we think is the right number that where people should feel like, you know, we're, we're sort of at a population level where um, concerns may be diminished? I'll start off on that and then teed off to Adam. Well, you know, herd immunity is really 
not something we use too much anymore because it really depends upon what herd you're talking about. If it's the herd of planet Earth, we're nowhere near herd immunity. So really, I, the, the, I think the better word that makes more sense is community immunity. Uh, I would be remiss to say that uh, I, I'm very proud of Delaware County. Delaware County has the highest vaccination rate out of Ohio's 88 counties. So uh, th that um, should make Delaware County a safer place as far as COVID activity goes. But really, um, you know, with the more transmissible or the more contagious uh, Delta variant, which is in Ohio, and it was announced today at the level of the CDC that over 80% of all tested uh, uh, strains are the Delta variant. So you can assume that that's probably going on in Ohio too. But with a more transmissible, more contagious uh, um, variant out there, uh, that level of herd immunity is a little bit higher. So, so we really need uh, to get everybody as, as best as we can with a degree of immunity from being vaccinated. Adam? Sure, thanks. Um... I would just follow up, you know, herd immunity, it's, it's not some big secret number. It's a simple math formula. Once you know the R naught, you can plug the number in, you can look up the formula for what herd immunity is for any population there. So it's, it's, it's nothing new to anybody here. Um, and it's not something that's unachievable, right? For something like measles, we need about 95% of the uh, people out there to be immune and we get there. For something like smallpox, we need 86% of the population and we get there. So getting to a level where we're protecting each other is possible. It really is. Um, the, I like my analogies, obviously, and I always compare herd immunity to uh, fighting a wildfire, a forest fire, right? The whole uh, point of herd immunity is to get in front of it. So when you're fighting a wildfire and it gets out of control, like the virus is out of control here, what you do is you start to get in front of it and you start to cut down trees because you wanna stop giving the, the fire or the virus in this case, places to go. And developing herd immunity is stopping to give this virus places to go because it runs into dead ends. It runs into vaccinated, it runs into me and I'm vaccinated. So I'm not gonna keep the, the fire going here. So it's about getting in front of it and giving this virus less places to go. So that way it stops spreading. And again, it's something that we can get to and um, we've got to it. We've got to that number for multiple other diseases out there and we can do it for this one too. Um, if we all take the vaccine. Thank you. Uh, this question is for, for President Jones. Is Ohio Wesleyan willing to guarantee the safety of students who comply with the vaccine mandate or assume liability of adverse reactions? Uh, thank you, thank you, Dwayne. Uh, we are relying upon the CDC uh, for uh, information about uh, and other reliable sources that the vaccination is safe. Um, we know that there nothing is perfect, uh, but as we've heard uh, from Adam and from Dr. Gasalda this evening, uh, there is every indication that it is far safer to be vaccinated than to run the very small risk of adverse effects that may accompany um, uh, something that happens to a person who is vaccinated. So. Uh, the CDC reports that serious side effects to, that could cause a long-term health problem are extremely unlikely uh, following any vaccination, and vaccination including COVID-19. Vaccine monitoring has historically shown that side effects generally happen within six weeks of receiving a vaccine dose. And, uh, for this reason, the FDA required each of the authorized vaccines to be studied for at least two months, eight weeks after the final dose. We know that more than 338 million people have received a COVID vaccine or 338 million doses of the vaccines have been administered um, in, in uh, this country. The CDC continues to closely monitor the safety of the vaccines. If scientists find a connection between a safety issue and a vaccine, FDA and the vaccine manufacturer will work toward an appropriate solution to address the specific safety concern. As Ohio Wesleyan has not manufactured the vaccine, distributed the vaccine, independently studied the vaccine or administer the vaccine, the university is relying on the CDC's assessment and upon other reliable sources. As with other vaccine mandates that the university has had in place, the university is not able to guarantee the safety of students who comply with any vaccine mandate or assume liability for adverse reactions. Thank you, Rock. Um, can uh, one of our medical experts on the panel discuss the issue of sort of um, the 
infections that occur with vaccinated individuals. We, we know breakthrough, I think that's what they've been calling them, breakthrough infections, or um, uh, just the efficacy of the, the vaccines in terms of, I think we're 90 to 95% with most of yeah. uh, them. Can you talk I'll, a little bit about that? I'll take a stab at it. So um, breakthrough infections are defined as somebody who has a positive test after being fully vaccinated. And when we talk about efficacy, that is the word that's used in the clinical trial. That may or may not affect real world experiences, which is effectiveness. So when we say in the clinical trials, the vaccines were 94, 95% effective in preventing uh, symptomatic COVID-19, that is a measure of efficacy. So when you look at the clinical trials of Pfizer and Moderna, there were people who were fully vaccinated who still had symptomatic COVID-19. Um, so again, um, no vaccine is 100% effective. So here's how the vaccines perform. The vaccines perform the best at preventing somebody from dying or being hospitalized. Yes, it is true. The vaccines also can prevent people from getting infection, but it's not foolproof. Some of that real world effectiveness is down a little bit with the Delta variant, but still, if people do get infection after being fully vaccinated, they're either gonna be asymptomatic, and if somebody is fully vaccinated and has asymptomatic infection, they're less likely to spread it to somebody else because they have a low viral load. And if somebody does have a breakthrough infection after being fully vaccinated and is symptomatic, their symptoms are mild to moderate at best. As previously stated, breakthrough infections resulting in hospitalizations or death are extraordinarily rare at this time. Adam. You know, I think I, I'll just quote our numbers once again, you know, folks, 99% of cases since March 1st, unvaccinated, all right? 100% uh, of deaths since March 1st, unvaccinated. You know, I, the numbers speak for themselves when you're looking at this stuff. Um, I, another thing about the vaccination, I think that it's important to um, let the parents know about too. If you are vaccinated, if you have a high risk exposure, quarantining is not recommended unless somebody is symptomatic. Also too, uh, the CDC recommendations are for most people, and again, there's caveats and some exceptions, testing should not be done on somebody who is fully vaccinated and COVID-19 asymptomatic. Thank you. Um, Rock, there's a question about exemptions and why we have a, a process to consider uh, evidence that's submitted related to um, a petition for exemption from uh, our COVID vaccine requirement. Can you speak to why we need to review those and versus just taking a letter from a, a provider or um, something else that would, without question? Sure, we have, uh, our, we're following the same process here that we do with other vaccines. Uh, where there is the possibility of petitioning for an exemption based on the um, conviction of a religious organization to which a person belongs. Um, that's different from a person's own personal feeling. Um, but if, if the religious organization has, has taken a doctrinal stance, that's something that we consider. Um, and then if the student has medical reasons uh, not <clears throat> Uh, to be vaccinated. Uh, we want to review those uh, reasons and we'll ask our panel of experts uh, to look at the, at the scientific evidence and determine whether or not those reasons actually do put the student at risk. Um, and so we have a, a, a team on campus that, that reviews uh, the, the request in consultation uh, with physicians and other medical and infectious disease experts uh, when, when the applications for exemptions are, re are received. Uh, we've had a relatively small number of applications, um, and we expect an even smaller number to be approved. Thank you. And, and Dr. Castaldo, this might put you on the spot a little bit, but um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about, um, you, you know, that not all physicians are experts in infectious diseases or other 
uh, related matters uh, to COVID-19. And it doesn't mean they're uneducated completely about it, but they may not have studied the issue as deeply as, as you have and some others. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, so uh, again, I'm the la if you need your hip replaced, I'm the last person you want to go to. Now, if you have a hip infection, I can help you out. And, and you know, medicine is so specialized. And even within infectious diseases, there are various uh, subspecialties. And again, I think physicians are all essentially trained the same to analyze information. But really, within COVID, for the last year and a half, there is days where new things, new information come out every day, and things change at the turn of a dime. And it's really hard to stay current uh, on things. Again, this is all I've been really doing for the last year and a half. And sometimes I'm, I feel like I'm behind. You know, when it comes to the recommendations on the vaccines, I feel very confident with the mechanisms in place on how the vaccines are made available through the uh, FDA's vaccine group, and more importantly, the CDC's vaccine advisory group. And again, those two groups are independent of each other. They make independent recommendations uh, for use um, on the vaccine. So I feel quite confident knowing who the people are sitting at the table at the level of the FDA and the CDC. I listen to those calls. They, it's not a love fest. They ask a lot of detailed questions. They review VAERS reports. They have uh, transparency. They're open to the public. People can ask questions at the CDC meeting. I feel very confident in the recommendations that come out in the CDC level. Thank you for that. Um, Adam, this question uh, might be best uh, posed to you. and. Uh, it, it's it's more about sort of the the risks of students living in a college community, um, and and you know is that is that a higher risk environment from a public health perspective, um, in in terms of the kinds of ways that we want to mitigate those risks, um, and you know the the question is also related to the faculty and staff, who are also on campus but are not living in congregate den denser uh, environments like students are. Um, and uh, not socializing in the way that college students socialize, uh, often in you know close settings, laughing, lots lots of loud talking, um, those kinds of things. Can you speak to from a public health perspective your view of you know you, we took some pretty austere measures in the fall when we saw some of our buildings uh, develop some positivity within them. So why is that? Yeah, sure. So. I mean, we have to think about what, what kind of disease this is. This is a, a respiratory illness here that we're talking about. So every time that you're around someone, the longer you're with them, the more at risk that person's becoming. So when we're talking about students living in the same, uh, the same dorm, living in the same house, when you're talking about your, uh, uh, your fraternities there, now you're having a lot of interactions with those folks throughout the entire day. And what we saw last year is, you know, they can try to take precautions, but there are just so many things that you do day in and day out with your family members. And if you're living in a fraternity, those are your family members. And your precautions that you're taking at that point in time are going to go down. You know, when we go home, uh, we take our armor off and we relax a little bit. And it's the same thing that happens when, um, you know, these students get at home with their family, their, 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 their roommates, their fraternity brothers, their sorority sisters, you know. So they're putting themselves at greater risk at that point. And it's all about the buildup. You know, the longer ventilation is a way to reduce the chance of getting this disease. Um, so you know, the longer you're in an enclosed environment, the more risk that there is for you right there. And isolation and quarantine isn't stopping. You know, it's still happening right now. Um, last year, we, um, we had to work with a lot of different housing units um, on campus about quarantining. And it was very unfortunate because there were times when we had to quarantine an entire house, you know? So um, it's not just one person who was in contact with them um, in, a, in a classroom, it's this entire uh, building of, you know, 12, 14, however many people are there. So, you know, there is a real risk by that continuous exposure, um, sharing of, uh, 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 of things that you don't really think about. You know, there's a lot of things in the kitchen when you have a shared kitchen that you share that you don't necessarily think about as much as when you're out in the public. So it's all these shared environments, this buildup um, of time together that puts them at a higher risk there. 
And at the end of the day, none of us want to see the students get quarantined, right? None of us want to see them have to spend 10 to 14 days in an area that's been designated for quarantine students. You know, it's a, it's a terrible thing to do. They're missing out on really their college experience. They're missing out on their education. They're missing out on their friends. They're missing out on, you know, day-to-day -day living. Um, and if there are anything that we can do to try and help um, these students be able to live the, you know, regular college life, I think that's, that's what we all have to try and do. And getting vaccinated is um, really that ultimate thing that we can all do to help everyone um, through it. Excellent. Thank you. And, and Rock, uh, I'd like to, we're at the end of our time. So any concluding remarks from you? Yeah, I thank you, Duane. And I'd like to thank uh, all of those who participated in the panel, uh, Dr. Castaldo, Adam, uh, Dr. Bailey, uh, uh, Dr. Martin, uh, the Falcos, uh, Duane, thank you for your leadership. Um, I, I recognize that this is a profoundly difficult time and a profoundly difficult situation. We have uh, done our best to make the decisions that we believe are best and most appropriate for Ohio Wesleyan. I think it's fair to say that any decision we make will have those who are happy and those who are unhappy. At the end of the day, that's not the real issue. The issue for me is what gives us the most robust opportunity for our students to come to campus to be safe and healthy and to have the kind of experience that Dr. Bailey described as she visited with us uh, in, in, in her remarks. We want students to be in the classroom. We want them to be in the laboratories. We want them to be in the studios. We want them to be on the playing fields. We want them to be in the residence halls without inhibition. We want them to be in the dining halls. Uh, we want them to not have to wear masks and keep their distance and follow the protocols that are necessary uh, when we're uh, not all vaccinated. The good news is, as we have heard from our medical experts this evening, uh, we have a vaccine that has been highly effective, one of the most tested vaccines in history. Um, it is uh, proving to be, do excellent work, and we believe it's the right decision for Ohio Wesleyan. So thank you all for your time and for your consideration. And I look forward to seeing students on campus in just about a month and to beginning a year uh, that I, I believe will be the one of the best we've ever had as we return uh, to the things that make Ohio Wesleyan, Ohio Wesleyan. Thank you and good evening.